Hey everybody, today we're going to be showing you how to attach a box blade to a tractor. Now before you turn away and discuss, because you think this is a topic that doesn't concern you, a topic that can't be of any benefit to you because you either already know how to attach a box blade to your tractor, or you use your tractor in ways that do not require the use of a box blade, let me just stop you there and say this. Can't there be value inherent in the act of learning? Isn't it nice to learn something just to learn it, regardless of its direct impact on your daily activities and chores? What's wrong with learning for learning's sake? Nothing. Nothing's wrong with it. I've spent my entire life in the pursuit of knowledge, and let me tell you, almost everything I've ever learned has not been useful to me in a practical manner. I can't tell you how many nights I've stayed awake until the wee hours of the morning studying up on some technique or history that had no value to me other than its value of new knowledge. I don't regret a single moment I've spent learning about Roman aquacultural techniques, or the proper method for repairing a pair of leather gloves, or how much the sun weighs. I love knowing stuff, and I love learning stuff, and you would too if you knew it was good for you. But alas, you kids these days don't see the value in learning unless you think it'll benefit you immediately and immensely. I don't mean to sound like the old man that I am, but things were different when I was your age. Children didn't spend all their free time touching telephones. In fact, we didn't even have a telephone in our home until just after I moved out to live on my own. I never even used the phone that was in my parents' house. I had no need to. I could just go over there and speak to them in person. Speaking to people face to face, that's what it's all about. You lose so much when communication is in writing, or even when you're yelling through a wall or some other physical barrier which blocks the recipient of your words from view. Maybe they're down a well or in a gulch or something, I don't know. So much of communication comes down to how somebody's face looks, the way their wet little lips glisten and shine, the way their acne scars and ingrown hairs bulge and shimmer in the noonday sun, the way the white foam collects in the corners of their mouth, and you try not to keep looking at it, but you do because it's weird and gross. Why does that white foamy spit collect there? Why does that only happen to some people? It can't just be because they're thirsty or something. This guy just took a big ol' sip of water right before he started talking and dribbled right down his chinny chin chin. It got on his shirt. You try not to look at the dark spot on his shirt either. You do everything you can to avoid letting him notice that you see the spit in the corners of his mouth and the dark water spot upon his breast. Then you think to yourself, maybe I should just tell him that he's got a case of the old spit corners, a case of spitty mouth. It's not that embarrassing, right? It happens to people all the time. Well, I guess it doesn't happen to people all the time. You can't remember the last time you had a conversation with somebody who had the weird bits of spit in the corners of their mouth, and it's sort of dried so the spit is adhered to the top and bottom of each mouth corner so when they open their mouth the white foam separates and when they close their mouth it rejoins. A rack of foam washed up on some defiled ruinous beach visited by no being other than death who stalks the water's edge waiting. Thirsty to take any life unlucky enough to land on this horrid stretch of powdered glass and pulverized bone. <clears throat> anyway, maybe you should say something to him about the spit in the corners of his mouth. Sure, you don't know him that well, but there's the old rule regarding social etiquette and letting people know that something about their appearance is off. There's probably some fancy rhyme or saying to it or something, but it boils down to this. You should only tell somebody that something about their appearance is off if it would take them less than 30 seconds to fix it right then and there. I mean, you don't want to tell somebody that their new haircut makes them look like a guy you saw on the news the other night who got arrested for stealing frogs and then painting them weird colors and trying to sell them to a museum, but the museum people were smart enough to know that they weren't some rare special frogs or anything. They were just normal slime toads that this dope had painted silver to make them look like they were endangered or something, so he got thrown in frog jail and his mugshot is a real laugh because his hair looks so stupid. You don't want to tell somebody that their haircut makes them look like the frog thief because they can't do anything about their haircut if they're out and about with you, but if they've got something in their teeth or they misbuttoned their shirt, it's alright to let them know, kindly and gently of course, because they're able to remedy those issues right away without much trouble. So yeah, you've decided to tell this guy that he's got a serious buildup of white spittle in each corner of his mouth, but right as you're about to let him know, you realize you haven't been paying attention to anything he's been saying for the last few minutes because you've been too busy thinking about proper etiquette and the guy who stole those frogs and got caught and is in prison for 60 years. Sure, 60 years seems like a long time for a frog-related crime, but it wasn't the frogs that brought such a hefty sentence, it was the music 
museum aspect. Apparently, it's extremely illegal to lie to a museum. It doesn't matter what it's regarding. If you lie to somebody, anybody, while you're in a museum, I'm pretty sure you can be arrested. I don't really know why. I think it has to do with the separation of church and state or something. That's why I avoid museums. Anyway, you haven't been paying attention to old spit boy for at least the last three minutes, and now he's asking you what you think about what he just said. You're freaking out. You don't know what he just said, and even if you did, you hate being put on the spot like that. So you just stare at him for a second before saying, the, uh, you've got something in your teeth. You don't know why you said that. His teeth are fine. They're really in great shape. It's his mouth that's the source of everybody's problems. He starts digging between his chompers with his long brown thumbnail, and you think you're lucky stars that you've just bought yourself some time. He's digging away, really getting deep in there, really deep. His gums are starting to bleed in a few spots. He looks at you and shows you his teeth, and he can tell from your worried expression that something's wrong, and he asks, did I get it? He pulls his thumb from between his front teeth to see if he's been able to retrieve a piece of lettuce or maybe a seed from his pearly whites, but let's be honest, this guy doesn't eat lettuce. He hates the stuff. He won't touch a vegetable without a gun to his head, and he's proud to bring up that fact any chance he gets. In fact, he's wearing a shirt that says as much. You look down at a shirt that reads, I wouldn't touch a vegetable unless there was a gun to my head, and it has a picture of Bugs Bunny eating a carrot with Elmer Fudd pressing the barrel of a shotgun to his ears. Did you ever stop to think about how truly horrific horrific and violent those old Bugs Bunny cartoons are. I say old Bugs Bunny cartoons as if there were new ones. Maybe there are new ones, I don't know. The ones I'm familiar with were old even when I was a child. I guess they're ancient now. I doubt you kids even have any idea of what I'm referring to. You probably think Bugs Bunny is some dead old aristocrat who lived in Boston in the late 1800s and worked at a factory making poisons. Sure, he was the owner of the factory, so his life wasn't like that of some character in a Dickens novel, but it was still the 1800s, so stuff was way harder than it is now. They didn't even have running water or toilets or cars back then, I don't think. I assume I'm right, and you will too if you know what's good for you. Bugs' real first name was Arthur, but everybody called him Bugs because it was ironic. Get it? Do you get it? He was the owner of a factory that made poisons, specifically bug poisons, so people called him Bugs. It's like calling a gigantic man tiny or calling me Einstein. You get it. Arthur Bunny began life in a middle-class home under the strict upbringing of his father, Simmons Bunny, and his mother's father, Granule Bunny. His mother died in childbirth, and his father never let him forget that if it weren't for his being born, he'd still be happily married to a woman who was once referred to as the third handsomest woman in all of Dukes County. Arthur led a rather unremarkable life until his 22nd birthday. It was on this day that his great uncle died and left him the keys to a profitable little poison manufacturing plant in Boston. Arthur, having few friends and even fewer interests in his hometown, jumped at the opportunity to run a factory and poison thousands if not millions of insects. He packed his bags and arrived at the factory in bustling downtown Boston within a fortnight. He found the work of managing wretched men and filthy street urchins quite enjoyable. He was stern but fair with his workers, and they much preferred his rule to that of the former owner, Arthur's great uncle. Under his stewardship, the factory produced more poison than ever before. They even started producing a wider range of poisons. Sure, the bug killing business was good. There was never a shortage of bugs in Boston, but the raw materials needed to concoct these simple killing formulas were cheap, and he couldn't justify selling his product at much of a markup. As such, he spearheaded a program of formulating poisons for much larger creatures, horses, elk, carnivorous birds, alligators, you get the idea. The new poison sold like hotcakes, which had recently been invented and were selling quite well. Arthur was doing just fine. He was now primarily going by bugs, even though the insect poisons were making up a smaller and smaller portion of the annual sales with each passing year, but the nickname was given to him affectionately by the factory staff and it held a special place in his heart. He was now 28 years old and he'd built the poison factory into something much grander than it had been when he had inherited it those few years ago. Bugs Bunny was a happy man. He was happy, but not satisfied. For the past six years, he'd focused on nothing but his business. He had amassed a sizable fortune. He wore fine clothes and lived in a large home, which was built to his specifications. But it was empty. Not in a literal sense. He had a staff of 13 men and women who cooked and cleaned and did all sorts of domestic work at his manor. But when he arrived home after a long day of making liquids and powders, which would be used to stop other creatures from being alive, he often found himself feeling utterly and completely alone. 
His days were filled with such hustle and bustle, always signing papers, always dictating letters, always rushing across the factory floor. Whenever he was home, where things moved at a much slower, quieter pace, he would fall into deep bouts of sorrow that grew and grew over the years until they were so debilitating that Bugs ended up selling the factory before he was 50 years old. He just couldn't cope with the loneliness, the silence. He couldn't stand it but he couldn't bring himself to do anything to change it. He wouldn't go out and he would have no visitors. He fired his servants. He lived in complete isolation for a time and is now buried in the old cemetery on Chappaquiddick Island next to his father and mother's plots. And I'm sure you're wondering how he died, so I'll tell you. Bugs Bunny killed himself by eating two bags of horse poison. Okay, are you happy now? Is that what you wanted to hear? Is your morbid curiosity satisfied for once? For once in your life?